In this video, we are going to go through all of the core pieces of a world-class game development project plan so that you can be sure to impress potential stakeholders and financiers and get the support you need for your project. We are Ask Game Dev, and this is how to create a world-class video game development plan. Welcome back! If you're new to Ask Game Dev, we make videos to help you learn about the games industry so that you can elevate your games and inspire others. If you're on a game dev journey, consider subscribing. We'd love to help you out along the way. One of the biggest challenges in making video games can be securing external financing to pay for development costs. Building a thoughtful and well-structured development plan is the backbone of any pitch for investment. So what will potential financiers want to know from your game proposal pitch? Ideally, that you have a great game concept and a well-thought-out plan on how to build it on time, on budget, and at a high quality level. This can be achieved through a variety of ways and should always be customized to the intended audience. But there are a few customary elements to any plan that you would be well served to include in your pitch. First, design scope. The first part of any good plan is to get your audience excited about the game concept. A detailed game design pitch is a deep topic that we'll probably tackle in another video, but we found that a good strategy is to cover the pillar features of your game, why your idea is better or more interesting than competitor titles, and what the opportunity is based on market data for rival games. Also, beautiful concept art or early prototypes can be a great way to showcase your design vision. With design pitches, it's usually better to show than tell. Once you have your game outlined, the next part of your planning is to show the relative costs of each feature of the game, or what the industry calls your project scope. The scope is typically detailed in days of work needed to get the feature to a point where it is representative of the final design and fully open for testing by quality assurance. Achieving fully open for testing status can be referred to by many names, but the term alpha or feature complete are common naming conventions used in this industry. Scope estimates are typically broken down by all of the team members that will need to participate in the development for that particular feature. For example, let's consider a hypothetical run mechanic for a character. A designer, a character modeler, an animator, and an engineer may all be required to help out in efforts to get the character to run in engine. And we would make estimates for each discipline's participation in man days. Estimates are a best guess and are often revisited throughout development as more is learned about the work and the team's speed of execution. You'll want to repeat this estimation process for all features in your game, and then group the tasks in a smart way so that you can see the relative time costs of each major feature. Once this is complete, you have defined your project scope. Next, team and capacity. Now that you have your scope defined, the next task is to detail your staffing plan to address that work. This involves listing all of your proposed team members, when they can start work on the project, and when the team plans to be at alpha or feature complete. This is your development period. Once you have those start and end dates, you'll want to calculate the amount of work days within that period while accounting for holidays and any non-work days. This is your team capacity, and you'll want to have it broken down by all of the major team disciplines that are meaningful in your development. Typical discipline categories might include engineering, 3D modeling, 2D art, animation, or design. You will then take the anticipated scope and calculate it as a percentage of the capacity. You'll want to see your scope at something less than 100% given that your staff will inevitably miss some development time due to unforeseen commitments or sick time. If your scope is greater than 100% of capacity, then you'll either have to reduce scope or add more resources to your team. Now let's talk about schedule. So now you have defined your project scope and the team capacity that you will need to address that work. The next step is to take all of your scope tasks and put them in order of expected completion. This is your project schedule, often referred to as a Gantt chart, and it is typically put on a calendar timeline. Microsoft Project, Handsoft, Jira, and many other project management tool sets can be used for this purpose. We'll have links to each one of these in the description. First note that the recommendations in this video will focus primarily on waterfall development principles, despite the fact that many studios in our industry have embraced agile development. At a high level, Waterfall is very predictive and planning intensive, while Agile is more fluid and embraces iteration. The debate around the merits of each methodology rages on, but that topic would need its own video. So we won't go deep into that topic other than to say that we choose to focus on Waterfall because it typically aligns well with the predictability that financiers expect to see in an initial pitch. Moving to Agile when development actually starts is an option that you can always consider. In terms of features, there is no hard rule regarding what order to use for execution on your features, but it is generally accepted that you'll want to address the key product pillars first, with specific focus on proving out any pipelines or tool sets that will be needed for when your team ramps to full staffing. So focus your early development on what matters most in the game and what tools unblock team members from adding to productivity. 
The schedule is a critical step to ensure the validity of your plan, as you may have some tasks that have dependencies that could cause key dates to be missed. For example, you may have three tasks that fit into your total capacity, but if one cannot be started until a different task is completed, you could overshoot your expected feature complete date. These situations can be common when the team is dependent on delivery of certain items from external partners. And when you see them, you may need to shuffle the order of operations of your tasks, add additional capacity, or reduce scope. Now let's talk about milestone deliverables and themes. So you have your schedule fitting and all of your scope is accounted for. The next step is to break your plan into milestones and define the work that will be done in each. Milestones can be any length and should be customized to your particular development goals, but monthly or four-week milestones seem to be common in professional studios. Milestones are typically where team leadership takes account of how they have progressed against plan to date and determine any changes that need to be made to the go-forward plan. Now let's talk about how game development works from a timeline perspective. Typically, development plans use a two-phased approach that has been borrowed from the film industry. Specifically, the first phase of development is called pre-production and is usually staffed with a small team of core experts. This phase is commonly used to build a first prototype of the experience to make sure that the development plan is solid. Once this happens, the project moves into full development or the production period. This is when the team typically grows in size and operates at full capacity. Gameplay depth and content creation are usually the goals of this period. At the end of production, the game is usually at an alpha state, where features are complete and open for testing, and the art and audio content are representative of the final quality. The quality assurance efforts usually ramp up at the alpha stage, with testers hammering on the game to ensure that it is solid. Once the build is relatively bug-free, a beta version can be provided to a small sample of consumers for some live feedback. After addressing any final issues, a release candidate can be achieved that can act as the final version that will be released to the public. So now that you understand what each development phase looks like, you need to pencil in milestones for each, including deliverables. Giving each milestone a theme allows stakeholders to understand the main purpose of that period of development. Themes are also a good way to rally your team around a collective purpose for that phase of development. Once your deliverables are defined, QA can test your game against those goals and provide feedback on your team efficiency. And external stakeholders can review this feedback to gauge your likelihood of hitting the goals of your development plan. The process of setting deliverables and reviewing progress at the end of a milestone happens frequently throughout development, and the specifics on the plan can change frequently. And lastly, let's talk about risks. A final piece of your development plan is to define the project risks. Risks are things that could affect the cost, duration, or quality of development output. Every project has risks, and the best developers constantly review the risks and figure out how to mitigate them. So what is a risk? A good test is to ask yourself if the team has complete control over that issue. If the answer is yes, then it probably isn't a risk. It might just be difficult and something that financiers will expect the team to navigate. A risk is commonly something that is out of control of the development team, like an external piece of technology that will be needed. Typical examples of a risk might include the delivery of a necessary piece of technology by an external team or an unclear first party ruling on the acceptability of one of your features. When you define your project risks, the key things to determine are what specifically are the possible implications of that risk, how you plan to mitigate the risk, what your contingency plan is if you can't mitigate it, who ultimately owns the mitigation of the risk, and at what date you plan to either close the risk or have a significant update. Having a clear and thoughtful understanding of the project risks shows the financier that you've thought deeply about how to execute development and how to reduce the chances of not delivering on expectations. So now you know the pieces of a professional grade development plan. You can use this format to pitch for investment money or to provide milestone updates when already in development. Let's get a conversation going and help our fellow channel subscribers with your thoughts on how to develop a development plan. What do you think are the key elements of a plan? What do you think differentiates a plan and makes a plan stand out? Let the Ask Game Dev community members know your thoughts in the comments and we can all learn together on this topic. Thanks for watching, we are Ask Game Dev and we make videos on games, the game industry and more. If you like our content, please subscribe. And as always, we'll be back next week with a new video.